I appreciate uh, your remarks, Brooke, <clears throat> and thank you all for hanging out after time. And I'm going to ask for some water. I'm starting to lose my voice here. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, my brain's humming. Wasn't that the phrase from this morning? Got our brains humming. OK. So we're late. We've had an impossibly diverse set of talks. We're dealing with the biggest issues of our identity and global problems. I've got a cold <laughs> coming on. We've got rush hour starting. It's a beautiful day outside. All forces are conspiring against me. So let's go at it, OK. So thank you. Thank you to all our guest speakers, to all, all my CHN colleagues who work so hard, and especially to especially you who have hung out through the whole afternoon and are still here. Steve, thanks so much. Well, thanks to everybody, but Steve says he doesn't envy me. Well, I don't envy myself. <laughs> it's been a long, rich day. I'm not going to look at you because I'm going to be staring at my notes and riffing a little bit. I was a little worried when I was originally given this assignment because I first read it as Kurt's going to summarize. Then I said, he's going to synthesize. Now I'm terrified because that's even more hard. It's hard to summarize, much less synthesize. I'm going to start with the title of, of this day. I'm going to start with the program. And when you look at the very top, it, healing nature. And again, this goes back to a comment I made in our discussion yesterday. I read that two ways. Healing is a verb, right? Something we do to nature. But it's also, if I remember my English major, and that's a long time ago, uh, days, it's a gerund. It's something that, it's an adjective. It's a verb serving as an adjective, right? It's something that describes nature. So it has a dual meaning. We're healing nature's quality in the active sense, but it's also the healing quality of nature. This is that reciprocity issue that we were all thinking about through the day. Is it about us or is it about that? Well, it's about both because it's all one thing. And how do we understand this term? Well, I'm going to ask a little uh, performance art here. Can my colleagues, Anya, whoever else, can you roll up those shades on those windows? Because I'm going to do a little quick thought experiment for you. There, look at that. Oh. It's going from Renoir to Elliot Porter. <laughs> so I want you all, here's a 15 second exercise. Ready? I want you to look out at the birches and I want you to think of something you belong to. Something you belong to. All right. That was a 15 second, now I have a 30 second response. Yell them out. What do you belong to? Here. Okay, just one. What do you belong to? Garden. Garden. Trees. Trees. Air. Air. One another. One another. Botanic garden. Botanic garden. <laughs> what else do you belong to? Marsh. Family. Human race. Everything. Everything. Anyone else? Community. Community. Thank you. Nature. Nature. Any last contributions? Speakers? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did this through the day, and I'm going to read off a few others. I love that you mentioned garden first, because that's where we started the day. Here's some others on my list. Democracy, a democracy, family, neighborhood, landscape, economy, community, population, conversation, church, country, planet, watershed, flyway, club, Chicago wilderness. <laughs> we belong to lots of things, right? And this gets to the holes in the parts. We belong to lots of things. They're all important. They're not random. They're not out there as just blobs that are floating around. If I were being a proper academic, I'd give you that term, which is we belong to a series of nested hierarchies. 
That is, things, things are nested within one another. They're embedded within one another. And my academic colleague, who when, was one of my mentors, his way of uh, explaining this, especially to undergraduates, was to get up there and in his full British accent, read aloud, Horton, here's a who. We are embedded. And there are ways of understanding the relationships between that. So let me launch and I'm just going to read you just some statements of themes that arose from listening to our speakers. And I think you've all done this yourselves in your own heads and hearts. So I'm just going to read these in no particular order as I wrote them down, and I'm going to edit them as I read. I started with Laura's this morning. Health is a function of and expression of relationships, the patterns and processes that characterize these relationships, the flow of sensation and attention that shapes and renews these relationships constantly and continually, whether that's a personal relationship or a relationship to the cosmos and everything embedded in between. Bill Sullivan prompted this one. Our relationships to one another and our relationships to places, landscapes, and ecosystems are intimately related in complex ways. It's the relationships of people to each other and of people to place. And these are not two separate things. They're constantly feeding each other. Francis, Steve especially, um, brought in the role of the arts. And I come from an arts family, so this meant a lot to me. That the arts, and that includes architecture, cities, visual arts, performance, poetry, they're not about mere amenity or decoration or luxury, but about a deep aesthetic that recognizes imagination and connectivity as essential to health. The arts are not simply decoration. They're deeply involved in how we define health. And I'll define it the way Aldo Leopold did, as the capacity for self-renewal. So. Continuing a little bit with that, poetry is one of the arts we listened and shared today, but there were many others. That prompted me to write this. There are no healing landscapes without healing words. Or another way of saying it is there's an intimate connection between healing landscapes and healing words. And that led me to think the violence we do to our language, which we do every day, and boy, do we do it in election season. The violence we do to language is co-equal to the violence <clears throat> that our culture does to the land. There are people in those poems, he said. It was Martha who said, metaphors are a way of making sense of suffering. We deal with the world of wounds through words, but we discover in the process that it is also through words that we discover simultaneously a world of wonder and awakening and wholeness. Our words, like cantaloupe, ripen in black dirt. <laughs> Health is a characteristic not only of us as individuals, but of all the communities that we are a part of, all those things that you just named off. Those communities exist in and are embedded in complex ways and all are changing constantly kaleidoscopically. <clears throat> Can any of one of us be healthy in a community that is not healthy? We may be personally healthy, but does that mean we are healthy? Those are some of the themes. It doesn't mean we covered everything, and I certainly don't presume that I caught it everything that might fall into one of those big baskets, but there are some things we missed, and I had written down climate change. Not just in the way it was just spoken of, but as a critically important health issue for the future. The health impacts of climate, emerging diseases. These are more technical dimensions of medicine and health that there are a lot of people working on because they're coming at us and we need to think about them. Or to be a little more uh, imaginative about this, amazing, fascinating studies in just in the last year or two on the microbiome, the fact that Guess what, folks? Things are embedded in us. There are things that are a part of us. 
this is new science, folks. We have 100 trillion creatures living in our bodies. 100 trillion microbes. They only amount to about 200 grams. But there's 10 times more cells of other creatures than there are of us. It makes us define health and individual differently. And it means a lot in terms of human medicine, by the way. I'm wrapping up. Don't worry, Brooke. And by the way, one of the little factoids I learned while well, reminding myself of these numbers, in your mouth, you have 5,000 species. <laughs> I don't mean to ick you out here. Uh, I do mean to make a point about life, diversity, and health, and how we need to rethink some of our even most basic concepts and constructs. Okay, I was gonna end with three stories, I'm gonna cut it down to one short story. One last story, I couldn't choose which one. I'm either talk about the forests in Germany, which I love telling that story, but I probably won't tell that one. I could tell you the story of the political prisoner who found his survival by bonding with the cockroach. I'll pass on that one. So I'll tell you the story, Man Mound as the Closer. Uh, where I live, up near Baraboo, Wisconsin, there is an ancient burial mound. So imagine a thousand years ago, give or take 200 years, a group of native people, presumably ancestors to our contemporary Ho-Chunk, uh, did what they did thousands of times across our region here in the upper Midwest. They built a mound. They built all kinds of mounds. They built effigy mounds. They built conical burial mounds. They built linear mounds. The effigy mounds are especially important because they're in the shapes of animals, spirits, that connected the people to the earth and to the heavens. Outside Baraboo is the only less last remaining extant mound in the shape of the human form. There used to be several more, but they're all gone now. Most, about 50% of our mounds were destroyed in the last 150 years. There's one left. It's called Man Mound. And Man Mound lived for those thousand years without much happening to him except prairie fires passing over and oaks growing up and perhaps falling. Then the land survey came along in the 1850s. Land changed, land use changed. Uh, unfortunately, his, he's 221 feet long, 216 feet long. Unfortunately, his lower legs crossed the quarter section line. And when a road was built, it cut him off at the legs. You have to imagine the man mound. He's described by the original uh, description of this as in the, in the form of a man walking. Like that. And it cut him off at the legs. And there's a paved road that now has cut off his lower extremities and across the field is a pasture with cows in it. It is Wisconsin. Um, so for years and years, I dreamed of the day when we would be able to bring wholeness back to the man mound. For years and years, I thought about this. Of course, never did anything about it. And then I got a co-conspirator, my friend Rob, who's a devotee of mounds as well, uh, spray painted his legs back. <laughs> I helped him. And the funny story here is, he didn't ask for permission. Oh, well, he did actually ask for permission. And the, and the local, uh, local government official says, yes, but you have to do it with uh, water-based water paint so we can wash it away. Until the official noticed it had a, tra a calming effect on the traffic and the speeders in the, along this rural road. He says, can you keep that leg the legs painted? It's slowing people down. So he did. The paint did fade away, but two weeks ago, my friend Rob and I, once again, with another young intern of ours, went back and painted the legs of Man Mound back. And I said, Rob, this has to be a ritual. Every year we're gonna heal Man Mound again and reconnect art, landscape, people, humans, nature, and our little part of the world, hoping that it being embedded will be catalytic and hopefully now through this story, change you. And the last thing I'm gonna say, we've talked a bit about the power of stories today. So I'm gonna give you a homework assignment as I say goodbye and we all say goodbye for another year. 
as you're on your way home today, if you're driving or riding or walking with someone, tell them a story about healing and nature. If you're going home by yourself, tell yourself a story. <laughs> That'll work too. See you.